Horror games are known for having a scary setting, iconic examples being the mansion in Resident Evil, the town in Silent Hill, and so on. However, Fear and Hunger is what I believe to be the most terrifying location in any horror game, and that is the dungeon in Fear and Hunger. Despite it being a 2D RPG, everything inside this dungeon is twisted and depraved and looking to violate you in more ways than you can imagine, creating one of the most oppressive atmospheres created in any work of fiction, so much so that a lot of the things I have to censor to show on YouTube. So in this video I will explain how this place got to be so messed up, and the terrifying lore behind why the dungeon in Fear and Hunger is the way it is. But before we get into this, I'd like to ask for a like and subscribe, as it helps me make more Fear and Hunger lore videos like this. So with that out of the way, let's look into the darkness of the dungeon. The setting of Fear and Hunger is based on a dungeon used to keep prisoners that has always had a bad reputation for the inhuman treatment of prisoners, which would not entirely be uncommon in a medieval setting. However, things in this dungeon have gotten increasingly more depraved, even for the low standards of the time. It's clear that supernatural forces are at work here, making the dungeon into a living nightmare. Unfortunately for the player, this is where they are tasked to head into and rescue an important political figurehead named Lagarde. Sadly for anyone to step foot into this dungeon, this almost certainly mocks their doom. As the player enters the front gate of the dungeon, it becomes obvious that this place is dilapidated. It looks like nobody has taken care of this place in a while, despite on record this being a functioning dungeon. None of the torches are lit, and rubble is strewn across the floor in a haphazard manner. What happened to this place? Not just that, but as the player steps foot into the dungeon, they are immediately afflicted by something called darkness. This phenomenon makes people feel supernaturally scared and hungry while in the dungeon, demanding people to eat more food and stress relief more often than they otherwise would outside of the dungeon. In terms of game mechanics, this means that players will constantly have to manage their sanity and hunger by eating food, drinking alcohol, and smoking tobacco. This concept of managing your fear and hunger is the namesake of the game. The concept of darkness is an important context as to why the people in the dungeon are the way they are. You see, anybody that is in the dungeon is desperately scrambling for resources, which for many people tempts them to be more morally flexible than they otherwise would be. This constant pressure of fear and paranoia is an integral part of the game and overall theme of the Fear and Hunger franchise. You're not just battling enemies and monsters, but you're battling with the environment in finding resources. We've seen in our own real life history countless examples of people that were otherwise peaceful and rational actors doing things that would otherwise be unthinkable to them. This is not only historically true, but has been observed in first world countries that have modern sensibilities that end up acting in a crazed and violent manner when basic resources go missing for too long. This darkness phenomenon in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger essentially cranks this pressure for resources up and turns it to 11. We get to find out more about how this darkness plays out in a diary written by a captain named Rudimir who was leading a military expedition into the dungeon before you came along. He wrote down some of the details of this phenomenon. It was a mistake to take this position in these dungeons. It's next to impossible to keep any kind of order among the troops here. There are powers at play here that we, mere mortals, cannot fight against. I've come to accept the madness. A naked prisoner crucified on a sacrificial statue with his guts hanging out. Just another day in these dungeons. More and more troops are committing suicide every day. More food for those that are left. Orders to let some cultists do their wicked rituals here? Anything goes. All the gore and macabre scenery has become trivial to me. Scavenging for food and drink in these dungeons is a large part of the gameplay. A power fantasy, this is not. This also gives some insight as to why some items and abilities are in the game. More often than not, you will come across rotten meat, food that has been lying on an abandoned dinner table left to rot. Picking up this item, you'll find that it restores hunger at the cost of giving you parasitic worms, one of the many status effects in the game which makes your life so much harder. Nobody in their right mind would eat this, and yet 
If that's all you have and you need to eat, you will take the hit. Fear and Hunger has a habit of making you do things that are previously unthinkable. It's full of tough choices like this and there's even an ability called Devour which lets you devour bodies to recover some of your health. Now you can do this on corpses as in enemies that you have taken down, however if one of your party members falls in combat, they also leave a corpse. And I think you can see where this is going. Everyone who steps foot in this dungeon of fear and hunger is stressed to act in ways that they otherwise never would have. However, this is not the only function of this concept of darkness. The darkness in the dungeon also warps and twists people that stay here for too long. Anybody who spends time in it gets warped physically as well as mentally over time. And there is quite a bit of evidence to support that this is the case. Throughout various journals and notes that the player can find throughout the dungeon, we get to find out that the darkness of the dungeon does something to transform you over time. One of the first examples of this is what is left of the guards that were stationed here in the dungeon. These prison guards now inhabit a distorted and brutish form, bound with muscle and alien-like tissue growth covering their entire body who will attack you on sight with weapons and will try to defile you in more ways than you would want to imagine. Trying to communicate or reason with these monstrosities yields no results. Whoever they were before is obviously no more. They are now physically and mentally monsters who will attack you on sight. These were once relatively normal human beings that were doing a job, only to get corrupted by the darkness in the dungeon to the point where they are indistinguishable from monsters. That is not to say all those who get fully corrupted by the darkness are incapable of reason or maintaining a conversation. One example of a being that is touched by the darkness of the dungeon is a person named Trotor the White. As the player walks through the macabre rooms of the dungeon filled with all manner of tools of pain such as iron maidens and tables obviously not used for dining, the player bumps into a strange disfigured hunchback man who offers you to be one of his quote unquote test subjects and that you should trust him because he is a doctor. If a player is foolish enough to take him up on this offer, the player will be subject to a very gruesome game over screen which I don't think I can show on YouTube. If a player tries to talk further to this horrible man, there's also the option to rat out the location of Buckman and his crew, a traveller that you've encountered in the dungeon who is fleeing for his life. Revealing the location of Buckman to Trotter, he will reward you with valuable items for your betrayal. The question is, who is this Trotter character? As the player digs around other journals that he encounters, the player finds an entry in Captain Rudimir's diary which details the backstory of this man. It details how when Captain Rudimir and his company found Trotter in the dungeons, they were surprised at how different he was. According to their memory of Trotter, he was a noble knight of Rondom back in the day and by all accounts was a prodigy of warfare, who then went missing and presumed dead only to retain a memory as a war hero that died in combat. However, five years later, when they made it to the dungeon, they discovered Trotter was alive in the dungeons, but now… different. Now dishevelled and in a broken form, apparently the torture that he experienced in combination with the corruption of the darkness made him to become one of the many monstrosities in the dungeon, and now he uses the torture methods that were inflicted on him to hapless inhabitants that are in the dungeon. This gives us some perspective as to how profound the negative influence of the dungeon can have. Here we have what used to be a holy knight, beloved and respected by many, become a twisted and wretched form, and this is due to spending years exposed to the dungeon's influences. For every moment you spend in the dungeon, more and more of who you once were on the outside is lost, until one day you are unrecognisable to your former self. One noteworthy detail about the dungeon is the connection to the old gods. Throughout exploring the dungeon you will come across many ritual circles which can be used to pray or perform ceremonies in the name of old gods such as Sylvian and Grogroth 
as well as Almer. These virtual circles perform a wide variety of practical functions, allowing you to access supernatural powers from the gods that you otherwise wouldn't have access to, that is, if you have the affinity with that god to do so. This begs the question, why are there so many ritual circles in the dungeon? Well, we do get hazy glimpses as to what life was like in the dungeon before it degenerated into the hellscape it is today. But these ritual chambers and sigils are so numerous throughout the dungeon that you can only presume that the dungeon was a front for using prisoners as sacrificial fodder in these ceremonies. As we know for sure, at least Grogoroff demands sacrifices to gain affinity with him. We can see evidence of this being the case with dark priests performing a sacrificial ritual, as well as various other used bodies that have been thrown down the well in various stages of decay. These are presumably prisoners that were used in these sacrificial rituals, whose bodies had to be discarded. Chances are, if you were sent to the dungeons, you were not going to make it out. According to the environmental storytelling of this place, the main function here was to sacrifice prisoners as opposed to just keeping them locked up. However, all of this being said, that is not to say that all of the residents of the dungeon are monstrosities, evildoers and deranged cultists. There are, interestingly enough, an almost peaceful civilization that can be found local in these dungeons. These are known as cave dwellers. The cave dwellers are truly fascinating, who are these hairless pale blue skinned humanoid creatures with green eyes that have taken up residence in the level 6 mines, and have even built themselves somewhat of a civilization, with buildings and art constructed, albeit out of the skeletons of bodies. However that being said, they aren't immediately hostile to the player. Unlike most things in the dungeon, they do not attack on sight, but are rather puzzled and weary as to your existence. It seems like they are getting along by themselves and don't want to be interfered with. Trying to speak to a cave dweller, it clearly doesn't understand your language, but it does use some body language in an attempt to understand and communicate with you. However, if you speak to a cave dweller for a bit too long, it ends in another cave dweller bashing its head in with a rock. It's clear that these are extremely primitive creatures, but they do have some things going for them which make them sympathetic. They are figured out subsistence farming, where they grow cave moss, a staple of their diets and crops. In their residence you can find various crops where they are growing cave moss, so they aren't just killing people and eating them which is more than you can say for most of the monsters in this dungeon. And although their ways are brutal and macabre, they won't attack you unless you interfere with them in some way, either by interrupting one of their mating rituals or stealing the Cube of the Depths, a holy artifact to them. It's quite fascinating that despite the dire environment that they are in, they have managed to cobble together somewhat of a functioning society, albeit a brutal and primitive one, but it does seem like they want to be left alone, more than wanting to hunt you down. The player can encounter Doss here, who is getting beaten by a cave dweller. If the player rescues her, she reveals that they attacked her after she interrupted what she said was a primitive ritual and took this opportunity to proselytize them with the word of Almer. They obviously didn't appreciate this and set upon her, attacking her. So it's clear with the cave dwellers, they aren't going to attack you out of nowhere, you're going to have to annoy or interrupt them in some way. There's a certain level of tragedy to these beings. I believe they started out as human beings and wanted to get away from the horrors of the dungeon only to flee to the lower depths of the mines, subsiding off cave moss for nutrition. And after many years or even generations, spending time down here, they have adapted and physically changed into these pale skinned beings, never to know the warmth of sunlight in a constant struggle against the monsters of the dungeon. They have adapted into a primitive and brutal society, but within the context of this dire situation that they have found themselves in, one can begin to understand why they are the way they are. Unlike many of the other beings of the dungeon, they aren't trying to be monsters, but rather are trying their best in their own way to separate themselves from the monsters of the upper floors of the dungeon. And considering that the occasional humans that come down to their residence and interact with them are humans like Trotor and the cultists, 
it begins to make sense why they are so weary of outsiders and have human sacrifice as a culture. This isn't to say that the cave dwellers are moral, but it does help you understand why their society is the way it is. One thing about the cave dwellers which must be mentioned is that they are servants of the God of the Depths. This is an obscure deity which resides in the lower levels of the dungeon. It is a massive entity which organs can be found spread throughout the dungeon. These are called the Heart of Darkness and comprise the many organs that this god has. The god's mouth can be found in the mines near the cave dweller's society and the ideology and motivation of this god is very mysterious and not much is known of it except it embodies the concept of darkness and despair. According to Ragnar Valder, one of the characters that can join your party, the god of the depths is worshipped by those who are quote unquote forsaken and forgotten. Followers being the aforementioned cave dwellers, scarabs and various insects can be aligned with the god of the depths. Basically the god of the depths attracts vermin and forsaken creatures to it. In a mindless and never ending routine of simple and ultimately pointless tasks. A confusing aspect of the dungeon is where the line is drawn between reality and unreality. When you start out in the dungeon, things are really bad, but at least they are somewhat grounded in the setting. It is a dilapidated dungeon. However, the further you descend into the dungeon, the more and more insane and abstract the dungeon gets to the point where it really makes you question whether or not what you are seeing is real. Take for example the Flesh Pit. This is a unique corridor that can be found within the game which is comprised entirely out of flesh, where an elevator can be found that will bring you down into the mines. Now what exactly is this place? I would hazard a guess and say that flesh wasn't literally taken from bodies and placed on the floors and walls manually, but it could be that the player is experiencing some sort of illusion or lucid dream where they are seeing an abstract concept of the dungeon being built out of the dead. Either that or some kind of reality breaking magic is used, or quite simply, the character you are playing as has gone insane and you are seeing what this person is seeing in his or her mad delusions. The point is, the further you go down into the dungeon, the more off the wall and interpretive the environment gets. When you get to the cube of the depths and go into the ruins of Maharb, an ancient ruins in a city long lost to time, are you really in Maharb? It seems unbelievable considering how strange of a circumstance is. We are literally traversing through ruins of an ancient city, time travelling between these ruins where there is now a sun in the sky despite you supposedly being under ground. And to make things even trippier, you are now communicating with gods inexplicably. The fact things get so weird and abstract the further the game goes on really begs the question as to how sane the player characters are at this point. It seems likely that you are experiencing some sort of lapse in sanity. My personal theory as to why the dungeon gets so off the wall the further you descend is that like how the darkness distorts and warps reality of mortals, it also changes the reality of the structure of the dungeon itself. It's likely that the dungeon wasn't physically built on top of the ruins of Maharadra, but that reality twisted the dungeon to create what seems like a connection between it and Mahabra, where the player can seamlessly be in the dungeon at one point and then be what looks to be overground where the sun is now in the sky. If this is confusing, that's because it is. And I think the game is designed to get more esoteric and abstract the further you go into it. I think at the point where you reach Mahabra, it really begs the question as to what the reliability of the narrator is, whether you are experiencing something that is real or not. What is the nature of the things you are experiencing? Throughout the dungeon of fear and hunger, you are exposed to a gauntlet of never-ending horrors, malevolent forces and shocking content which you essentially never see in games today. The footage in this video has had recordings with the censored mod and other bits of content which couldn't fly on YouTube I've blurred out. But why does the game have so much content which needs to be censored? There has been some criticism of this approach that the game has 
and some people questioning as to why the game needs to have so much shocking content. Like, was it totally necessary for many of the monsters in this game to be nude? Well, in the game's defense, I think a big reason as to why the monsters are presented in the way they are is because being naked derives some sense of unrelatability to them. You see, when you look at someone wearing clothes, there is a set set of assumptions that you make about this person. You know that they subscribe to the basic requirements of normalcy in a civilized society. They likely bought the clothes they are wearing, have a sense of fashion, and are part of a larger culture which is represented with these clothes and so on. However, if someone is wandering around naked, it communicates that they do not subscribe to your basic standards of normalcy, and are thus capable of doing anything. In other words, it demonstrates the insanity of these creatures and that they do not think anything like how you do. You don't know the rules that they subscribe to. And this, I believe, is the point Mira was trying to make with making so many of these enemies nude. It's not just including stingers for the sake of it. I believe it serves a purpose in the narrative and that it actually creates a sense of unrelatability between you and the enemies that you encounter. Some may shy away from this aspect of fear and hunger and just say, nope, this is too shocking and dark for me, and that's fine. However, branding fear and hunger as a game which is just edgy for the sake of being edgy I think is a mistake. The lore and setting of this world in Fear and Hunger is very fascinating in my opinion, and I've made more videos detailing the lore of this game, such as the video I made going over the marriage ritual, which you can check out in the video on screen here.